the Office of Naval Research. Revolutionary research. Relevant results. Protecting Navy divers and submariners. The Undersea Medicine Solution. A national naval responsibility. The Office of Naval Research Undersea Medicine Program explores novel approaches to improve the health, safety, and performance of submarine forces and divers. Navy divers conduct a range of missions, including deep sea salvage, rescue operations, and demolition. The goal for everyone in the world is to go deeper for longer, and to be able to stay longer, and to do it safely. Decompression sickness occurs when nitrogen bubbles form in the diver's bloodstream. It is life-threatening without treatment. ONR's research is focused on better understanding the causes behind decompression sickness and innovative ways to treat the physical causes before they occur. The current focus is more of a biomedical focus, leveraging newer technologies in biomedicine to take a look at immune system, effects of decompression, a genetic uh, responses to decompression, as well as gas exchange and cellular functions. The goals of undersea medicine research are to understand decompression sickness, prevent oxygen toxicity, and investigate other undersea health and performance threats. Dr. Jay Bucky, professor of medicine at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, is working on detection of problematic bubbles formed during a diver's decompression. So when they come back up, they're at risk for having these bubbles come out of solution. And if a bubble forms in a joint, it creates pain in the joint. If it forms in the lungs, people can start coughing. But if it were to form in the brain or in the spinal cord, they could be paralyzed or have what looks like a stroke. Knowing when and where the bubbles form in tissue is very important to understanding how to treat decompression sickness. Dr. Bucky's research includes an acoustic method of detecting bubbles. Right now, we're doing exercise studies. We're having people exercise and then measuring uh, bubbles in their tissue. And so we're looking to see uh, when they appear and then how long it takes them to go away. Dr. Walter Boron at Case Western in Cleveland, Ohio, and his collaborators are studying how gas molecules move through gas channels, a promising research discovery. Gas channels are proteins in the cell membrane that have holes that allow gases to move from one side of the cell membrane to the other. Well, we've actually discovered three important things about gas channels. The first is that they exist in the very first place. The second important thing that we've discovered is that it's possible to block the movement of the gas through the gas channels with specific chemical blockers. And the third thing that we've discovered, and perhaps the most surprising of all, is that gas channels have specificity for certain kinds of gases. Research reveals that preventing decompression sickness is a real possibility. A cellular study method called patch clamping is yielding new insights. So what we're interested in is to be able to assess cellular function at depth under various gas pressure combinations. And we do this in the form of the, using the patch clamping technique, which won the Nobel Prize for its inventors. At the Navy Experimental Diving Unit, researchers study the effects of depth on cells. Commander Keith Lenhart explains. The mission for the Navy Experimental Diving Unit is, is twofold. We do biomedical research, and we do independent test and evaluation of diving equipment and procedures uh, associated with uh, undersea environment and other extreme environments uh, for the Navy. In order to understand cell activity during various stages of decompression, NEDU employs patch clamping in a hyperbaric chamber. The technique we utilize, uh, whole cell uh, recordings, is a standard technique used in the pharmacological industry. However, putting it inside of a hyperbaric chamber becomes very challenging, and that's what we've, that's the, really the novel part to date. The culmination of ONR's research into the study of decompression sickness and oxygen toxicity is leading researchers into truly innovative discoveries and solutions. At the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Stephen Thom is looking at oxygen toxicity and decompression sickness as a disease and microparticles as the culprit. We had hypothesized, based on some other work, that decompression stress would increase the number of microparticles in the circulation. And it turns out we were correct. Uh, decompression stress causes a huge elevation in microparticles, and secondarily, those microparticles will cause an inflammatory process throughout the body. But probably more important in the context of human health is 
Having identified microparticles as at least a component of decompression sickness, we have also developed ways of getting rid of microparticles. Hyperbaric chambers are used for further study in the research laboratory at the University of South Florida. Dr. J. Dean is studying brain cell response to hyperbaric conditions. We asked the simple question, well, how do brain cells respond to hyperbaric oxygen? And the data showed quite convincingly that cells that were important in the control of your breathing, as well as your cardiovascular system in the brain stem here, were very sensitive to oxygen, excess oxygen. And so we wondered, well, are there early changes that occur in your breathing and maybe your blood pressure or your heart rate that might predict that you're getting to a dose of oxygen where you could have oxygen toxicity or seizures. Dr. Dean's work has shed light on the role of oxygen toxicity in seizures, as well as surprising new information regarding carbon dioxide retention. In addition, he and his associate, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, have been exploring the use of therapeutic ketone esters to delay seizures in warfighters where anti-seizure medications and a ketogenic diet would be contraindicated. The brain can use two fuels, glucose and the more efficient ketones. A ketone ester is a caloric substance. It is a highly efficient fuel for the brain, enhancing brain metabolism. So we're in the initial stages right now of developing and testing uh, several ketone esters and we have found uh, two particular ketone esters that have a very strong neuroprotective and anticonvulsant properties. And we think that these ketone esters, in addition to preventing uh, CNS oxygen toxicity, by enhancing brain metabolism, they have applications for not only ONR projects, but other neurodegenerative diseases. ONR's supported research at Naval Medical Research Center is looking at perfluorocarbons, a tool for accelerating the healing processes involved in decompression. Perfluorocarbon liquids carry more oxygen and carbon dioxide than blood. So our research actually in perfluorocarbons is largely pointed towards submarine rescue. When a submariner would come up to the surface from being trapped in a disabled submarine, we could actually treat decompression sickness without needing all the machinery that a hyperbaric chamber would necessitate. Researchers are also investigating the effects of sound on Navy divers. Dr. Michael Chin is the principal investigator at the Naval Submarine Medical Research Lab in Connecticut. The work that we do spans from uh, hyperbaric nitrogen narcosis uh, to the freq different frequencies that humans can hear underwater uh, as opposed to in air um, and, and to, the, to the areas of sound localization underwater. When you're on the surface, sound isn't that big of a deal, but underwater sound is magnified, so sonar and explosions can be very damaging to a diver in the water. So psychophysics really is different underwater than it is above water, but when you're underwater and you don't have a helmet on, you're a free swimming diver, you can hear ultrasonic sound. They're completely inaudible in air. And this may have a number of implications in terms of uh, uh, helping the undersea warfighter be more efficient. ONR's undersea medicine research continues to develop discoveries that will help the Navy diver and submariner remain underwater longer, work more efficiently, and return safely. What has been great about ONR is, is the, the ability to to have the vision, to see years into the future. Many of our performers at institutions are divers themselves, or at least have a, a great affinity for the roles that the submariners and the divers play in our armed forces. I would suggest that ONR and this lab has an obligation to the sailor, to the warfighter, to make those environments as safe as possible. For more information about the Navy's Undersea Medicine Program, please contact the Office of Naval Research.